having me here. It's definitely a, an honor to be at, at Illinois. I've, I told Sanjay when he first reached out to me through a common connection that we have at NVIDIA that I actually applied to, to go to grad school here a long, long time ago. And certainly was one of my top choices, but for whatever reason, I didn't get an acceptance letter back from Illinois until about two months after all the other ones had come back. And so I'd already visited other campuses and kind of made up my mind about where I was going. So it's, it was, it's exciting to finally be here in person. And I really. As I was saying to you earlier, it seems like things worked out for you anyway. Well, we'll see. I'm sure it could have been much, much better. I ended up going to some inferior school on the West Coast. That was the drawback. That was the drawback. I really suffered. But um, yeah, this is a, a great series that you put together. And it's definitely a, an honor to be here on the, on the same podium that NVIDIA and Epic Gaming and, and some of the other folks that are, are presenting. Are. So thank you very much for the opportunity and for giving me a, a chance to talk about Elemental a little bit. And I did, I did want to, I mean, obviously, we're, we're pretty careful about how much technical detail we go into when we're discussing publicly the, the technology we're working on. And, and we'll, we'll, I'll go into some detail about that aspect of our business. But I also, I think it's a pretty interesting story about how Elemental came to be and, and our, our path through building a company such as it is at, at this point in time. So for a lot of you folks here, there's, there's so much talent, I think, you know, thinking about starting your own company, following how we've done it, and seeing that you can really not have a lot of confidence in yourself on the business front, but have a lot of confidence on yourself on the technical front and, and go from there to build a great company. So please like, ask me any questions throughout the presentation. Don't wait for me to get to the end and then ask questions. I'm, I'm totally willing to, to answer any, anything you could, you could come up with. So just let me know. All right, so that picture there is our, our forthcoming server product, which I'm not going to go into detail in this presentation. But our core technology is really pretty exciting because it really spans a gamut of applications. And it goes from the, the initial consumer product that we launched first to our professional product, which we launched in just a, a couple months ago, to the server product, which we'll be announcing in, in the middle of 2009. And I think the GPU is a really nice architecture for Elemental to use because it's it's cost effective enough to go into things all the way from cheap consumer personal computers all the way up to professional video editing equipment to enterprise video data centers. So a quick background on, on what we're going to talk about today, uh, a little bit on Elemental. And obviously, Portland's a long way from Urbana-Champaign. Uh, just a little background about the company. And then, and then our story, like it, Elemental had, as I think pretty much every startup company does, a, a long and winding road to get to where we are today. And, and I don't know where we'll be in a year. Then Rapid HD Video Platform, which is what we call the core technology that we've built, the GPU accelerated video encoding, decoding, and pixel processing, and our product line today. So LML's background, we were formed in August of 2006. The team was all from a company in Portland called Pixelworks. And Pixelworks, which never grew to be a, a, a really large company, was founded in 1997, had a couple of really strong years. We built chips for flat panel displays, um, projectors, LCD monitors, plasma displays, that sort of thing. And, and it was a really a fabulous semiconductor company. So we were the first company to integrate all the different chips that ended up going into a projector into a single chip. And it was one of the first chips that was really commercially viable that had embedded memory. That was kind of the big breakthrough. But it really consolidated and made projectors go from being about that size in the mid-90s to today's like very, very small projector sizes that you can get. So Pixelworks is where we kind of saw what it could be like to work at a startup company and grow very quickly. Um, our mission at Elemental is to create the fastest, highest quality video solutions by harnessing massively parallel off-the-shelf hardware. And you know, mission statements are not something that we spend a whole lot of time in the startup land on, but I think it is important and we reinforce this to the employees whenever we can because you know, there's a lot of times when you're coming down to are you making an architectural decision or a coding decision or a marketing decision, what are you going to focus? What are you going to focus the message around? What are you going to focus the decision around? And if you have a mission statement, you can kind of go back to that and say, okay, we want to build the fastest. That should take advantage over maybe a quality tweak, make it get a couple extra frames per second. So having that, I think, has been really valuable for us. We're headquartered in Portland, Oregon. We just shipped product for the first time in Q4. Our, we had a beta release in, in middle of 2008 and made a lot of tweaks from there and actually shipped product in Q4 and had a really good quarter in a, a tough economic time. So it, it was very, 
it was very nice after two and a half years of running a company to actually have revenue. I'll tell you, that's, that's more exciting than anything else that happens in, in your company from venture capital financing or angel financing or hiring people. It's getting that first revenue in the door. So that was a nice quarter. And then the, the company is financed by um, General Catalyst Partners and Voyager Capital. They're two really good VCs. And if anyone wants to ask me, is, is thinking about raising a, a round of venture capital and would like to talk to me about it, there's a lot of things that should really go into that decision about the type of company you're building, the type of exit that you want to have, that your goals for the company are, and the trade-offs that come with raising venture capital. I think Elemental's been really lucky because we've got two venture capitalists that are are very invested in our success, not just financially, but also we have young, we have young board members from these two, these two venture capitalist firms that are still really very focused on making a name for themselves in the industry. They have they could unflagging desire to, to work their tail off for Elemental. They, they've become a, a really instrumental part of the company, despite, or not just despite, but in, in addition to the capital they've provided. So we've really lucked out on that front. Okay, so story of a startup. What did, how did Elemental come into being? And, you know, it, it, it's, been a, it's been a long path. We, we were founded in 2006. We came from Pixelworks where we left because we had this new architecture idea that we wanted to build that was completely different from what Pixelworks had built up to that point. Pixelworks had built very um, application-specific chips, and we wanted to build this new DSP-esque engine and, and use that to be the core defining logic for the chip. And, and the reason for this was because we'd learned through painful suffering at Pixelworks that you can build a deinterlacer and Samsung might be happy with that deinterlacer, but Sony wants something different. And then the customers start to really demand that you tweak algorithms time and time again to get the performance that they want, that their golden eye quality people are satisfied with. And so you end up having to spin chips a lot of times, which is very painful for a, a small company. It's painful for any company these days, but especially for a, you know, a mid-market, $100 million, $200 million in revenue found with semiconductor manufacturer. So we wanted to build an architecture that was based on a very programmable core image processing DSP. Um, we had a, a pretty fleshed out architecture. This is a, a high level picture that we were um, trying to, to get funded. The, the challenge was, and the challenge remains, that it's really difficult to get funding for a semiconductor startup today. The capital costs that go into a semiconductor company are, are high and getting higher all the time. The mass cost, tool cost, and so on. Most VCs kind of estimate that you're not going to get to revenue without at least 20 million in the door. And a lot of times people say it's probably 50 million these days to get the first chip that works well enough to actually get revenue from customers from that chip. And so we kind of banged our head against this, this concept that you're not going to get funded as a chip company. On the, on the flip side of the, the capital expenditure up front is the problem that the exits that semiconductor companies have seen have been really poor. The publicly traded markets have not been open to semiconductor companies. The, the larger semiconductor firms that were doing a lot of acquisitions like Broadcom and Marvell and Intel and those kind of folks, they've seen their stock prices really hit so they don't have the currency to do acquisitions anymore. So all of a sudden, you've got a lot of semiconductor companies that have been funded over the past 10 years that have $50 million into them, sometimes $100 million into them, and there's no possible exit. So the, the VCs that have backed those folks that really just have to keep trying to keep those companies alive and hoping that the market turns around. But until it does, they cannot put any more money into a new fabulous semiconductor company. So it was a very difficult and valuable lesson for us. Um, you know, we'd come out of Pixelworks. Uh, a team member of ours, Mike West, had been a founder of Pixelworks in 1997, found the company with about $7 million of venture capital, had built a company that went public and, and hit $200 million in revenue four or five years after being founded. And, you know, coming from that background, like the, the reality of what it was like to start a chip company in 2006 versus the reality of what it was like to start a chip company in 1997 was so completely different that you really couldn't grasp it without actually trying to do it. And, and trying to do it is really what gave us the, the lesson that it wasn't going to happen. We were going to have to be a different company, and we were going to be a company that was not using a semiconductor architecture of our own building. So, of course, the whole time we'd been working on this chip architecture, we'd also been following potential competitors. And one of those potential competitors was the GPU. And NVIDIA, in, in late 2006, 
had rolled out the, the G80 processor, which was one of the first DirectX 10 compatible chips, a very programmable architecture, immensely powerful relative to chips that had come before it, had 128 stream processors. And not, was, not only was it really powerful for graphics, but NVIDIA released the first programming API that made it possible to take advantage of all that horsepower for, graphic, for things beyond graphics, general purpose applications. And that was, of course, the, the CUDA platform. So we've been watching CUDA very carefully, and we were kind of concerned because it seemed like this was a, an architecture that not only was somewhat like what we'd been thinking about, other than not having all the peripheral type of system on chip aspects, but the, the core image processing logic seemed to be there. And so we said, OK, we can either close up shop and, and go work for another company again and, and not be in control of our own destinies, or we can kind of take a second, a second whack at this and, and take this core algorithm development we've done and port it over to the GPU on CUDA and see what kind of performance we can get. Question? I'm just curious uh, how many people were there in your company at the first stage and in the second stage? In the first stage, there were four so people. Oh, that? sure, absolutely. Good, good reminder. Sorry. Uh, the question was how many people were at the company in the first stage and at the second stage? And at the first stage, we started the company with three people, and then we hired someone right away, uh, a superstar named Brian Lewis. And when we made the transition, one of our initial founders was not interested in working in a software company. He was a chip designer through and through and just didn't have the interest of killing himself to build a software company. So he left. So for quite some time after we made this transition, we were down to three people. And it was, it was definitely a time where the three of us cranked to, I was working on putting, because I was a chip designer by training. That's, I haven't given you much background. I, I was a chip designer. and. Um, I was not as valuable as the other two guys who were software engineers and had been software managers and architects at Pixelworks and were able to, to do the first proof of concept on CUDA around an MPEG-2 and decoder. So, you know, in theory, things can always look good, and, and CUDA looked good from an application perspective, and the G80 looked good from an architecture perspective, but we didn't know if it was really going to work for, for codec. A decoder, and so we built a proof of concept MPEG-2 decoder and got very, very strong performance out of that MPEG-2 decoder, and that gave us the confidence to start bringing on other people and and convincing them to leave higher-paying jobs to to work at Elemental. <laughs> you don't want to do that to your friends unless you're fairly confident that the technology idea that you're working on is going to be successful. So yeah, April 2007, a full seven months, which is a really long time in startup land when you're going without without much capital. In, in our case, we had, we had left Pixelworks and convinced Pixelworks to give us a, a very small amount of seed funding, like a couple hundred thousand dollars, primarily to make it so venture capitalists wouldn't be worried that we were tainted with Pixelworks IP and that down the road Pixelworks might come after us and, and sue us for stealing any IP from the company. So, so we had a little bit of money from Pixelworks that was very close to zero by the time April 2007 rolled around. And of course, we talked to venture capitalists about the first idea. It was, it was a difficult transition because you're basically completely changing your story, completely changing your business model. And you know, it, that it was that choice or it was to go back to work in another big company. And as a startup, I think the number one thing I can relay is you've got to be completely flexible and agile and, and decide that running your own company is what's really important to you as opposed to the likelihood of success and, and, and everything else that, that comes along with it. And, and be willing to make you know, radical changes based on the market feedback that you get. Because there, there's no way to get that market feedback without going out there and doing it. And the market feedback can be really disappointing, as it was for us with the, the initial chip idea. So yeah, April 2007, we, we completely switched to a software model. And, and since then, things have, have certainly been better. It, it's, we've gotten very lucky. Uh, NVIDIA's really come through with some very powerful chips, and, and CUDA has been a very robust platform, which is really impressive when you think about how much engineering NVIDIA has had to put into CUDA, despite it not being their core business. I mean, it's, it, it's really amazing they've built this language that's, that's very successful in a very small, very small, like no revenue generating part of their business today. Do you have a question? Flash controller. So, okay, the, the original chip that we had we had thought about was um, 
an encoder transcoder that would be used for media gateways. So there's a lot of hard drives today that, you know, they're, they're these large hard drives that come with a decoder um, that you can then, like, if you have video content on that hard drive, you can connect it directly to a TV. And that was kind of a nascent idea back in, in 2006. What we wanted to build was um, a chip that you could put into a PC, most likely a PC, although it could be a standalone appliance as well, that would allow you to take video from any source, of the internet or DVD or Blu-ray or whatever you, you have, and distribute it across a home network or a wide area network. So kind of like the Sling idea. We wanted to build a, the perfect IC for a Sling box application that would go into a PC. And so there were a bunch of peripherals we had to have to make it so it would work in a standalone box as opposed to being in a PC box. And that's where the flash controller came from, the USB 2.0 on the go, that sort of thing. How about the real-time adaptive network control? Real-time adaptive network control, that's actually one of our um, early patents and well, one of early filed patents, whether it comes through for us is we'll know in 48 months or something. But um, the, the goal there was to take, because we had, we were encoding or transcoding in real time, we had control of all the parameters that went into that encode. And so the goal was to be able to measure the network performance and automatically adjust to what was happening on the network. So if you're on a home network over a wireless network, say, and you know someone turns on the microwave or um, someone sends a print job or sends a 10 megabyte PDF file, all of a sudden your network bandwidth gets cut in half. And since we were doing a real-time transcode, we had the ability to adjust the transcode parameters to, to go to a lower bit rate or it basically not make the video just completely stop, the, the delivered video stop, but, but keep going at a lower quality level. Well, we certainly have to drop on any peripheral functionality, but you know we're on a GPU or in a computer now, so that that part wasn't an issue. Um, as terms of the core codec, we haven't had to drop anything that we were doing around the algorithmic side of things, because the the CUDA and the G80 and later architecture has been really flexible enough to to do all the initial ideas we had around that sort of thing. It's turned out that that has been the businesses that we've gotten traction have that hasn't been as big a, a a use case so far, but it's still something that we think could be really valuable in the future. And, and there's, we, don't, we don't see any reason why we won't be able to do that on, on the GPU. Good question. Yeah, it's definitely not a one-to-one -one business transfer. Like, you, you accept different limitations when you switch your architecture pretty dramatically. OK. so. This is going to kind of frame, the, 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 frame the, the challenge that we were taking on the way that we framed it to investors primarily. So a lot of folks understand that there's this explosive growth in all types of video. And if, if you look at who's still getting funded today, it's really around video for the most part. And a lot of folks think video is a solved problem because they don't realize that you know, if you can do it on your phone, it's got to be a fairly low computational challenge. Well, of course, anyone who knows how video works, the encoding side is a much more complicated, much more computationally expensive part of the processing. And that's how all the algorithms have been designed. So we kind of framed the problem this way. There's, there's two solutions to the video encoding transcoding challenge today. On the folks that need high performance, so broadcasters, studios, folks that are, are willing to pay a lot to get real time, high definition, high quality encodes, they go with maybe a, an array of DSPs or several FPGAs or, or specialized ASICs that are just designed to process that video at a certain rate. And then on the folks that are cost constrained, which is a lot of the internet infrastructure type of people, you just have a CPU-based solution. Well, we were able to position the GPU as this really nice best of both worlds because since it's a commodity off-the-shelf piece of hardware, you get the cost advantages of the CPU, but you get a massively parallel processor that gives you the performance advantages of the specialized hardware. That's a sales pitch. There's definitely trade-offs. You don't have quite the low cost of a, a CPU-only infrastructure, and you might not have quite the performance of the very, very best top-of-the-line specialized ASICs. But you do retain the best characteristics of both. You do have close to the same performance processing horsepower as you do in a specialized ASIC. Your cost is very close, and you have the flexibility and, and software basis. So you, do, you don't ever get caught in a situation where a customer needs a codec tweaked a certain way or a certain extension to the codec that you can't provide because it's software-based, so you can always add it. 
So it's been a, it's been a pretty good model for us, and, and it's really allowed us to illustrate why this solution is the way to go for encoding and transcoding video. All right, so the solution we built, we call it Rappy HD, although we've gotten a lot of, um, I wouldn't say negative, but we've got some feedback that the name is not, is not very good because it's hard to pronounce and people don't know if it's Rapid HD or Rapid H Rappy HD or the French pronounce it Rapide. But, um, so we're probably going to be changing the name in the, in the li next little while. But it's really the key video processing software that harnesses the GPU. And something also we've been careful to start talking more about is that we don't just use the GPU or not. There's, I think, certain folks that have tried to move entire processing chains onto one architecture. And, and video processing is one of those things where there's certain parts of each codec that work really well on a fast serial implementation. And then there's certain parts that work really well on a, a, a fast parallel processor. So if you try to shoehorn the whole thing into the GPU, then it really can affect your performance negatively. And the key is to figure out how to allocate the different tasks between the different processors. And I think this is like a, you know, a really interesting area for, for research overall because in the real world, the, the balance of CPU processing power versus GPU processing power is, is really hard to know. A lot of consumers have a kind of ma ma mainstream CPU and a, a really high performance GPU, while others might have the other balance. And ideally, and we're not there yet, although we're really working on this, you'd be able to flexibly switch between codec parts that are running on the CPU versus the GPU. And I think the, the next kind of level of algorithm development is going to be around that flexible, taking advantage of whatever resource you have, a lot of, a lot of compute capability in. Question? Do we have serial CPU? Well, I guess serial is, you're talking about multi-core. Yeah. The question was, do we have serial CPUs anymore? And um, a lot of people do. Certainly in our market, there's a lot of folks that do have only a single or dual core. Um, one of the big selling points of our consumer applications is that we don't take the entire CPU. So you can have a CPU core or two remaining to run your normal applications. One of the challenges around transcoding, and I think why it's been it's taken a long time to get consumer acceptances. And even Adobe has struggled with this problem. People buy, like, get a free copy of Premiere Elements when they buy a, a handy cam. And the first time they try to burn a, a DVD and find that their computer locks up for six hours, they're like, I'm never doing this again. So, so one of Elemental's kind of focuses for consumer apps is saying, OK, we'll take a couple of the processors, but you still have others remaining for, for normal processing. Um, that said, you know, I think the CPU is still, each core of that CPU is by far the best serial engine that there is in existence right now, um, unless you're talking about a, a very, like, specific bitstream processor. So, so yeah, good question. We, but we definitely use the, the CPU and the parallel GPU together, and I'll talk more about that. Yeah? Just to the feel for concrete numbers, when you say outperform CPU over competitors, how mm -hmm. Again, it's kind of a, a difficult question to get exact on. Um, it, it's in the range of three to five on a, a, given, a given, say, equal caliber CPU and GPU. So, you know, a, a fast $200 GPU and a, a fast quad core. Now, the, the nice thing about the GPU is it's a lot easier to put multiple GPUs in a system today. So for enterprise type applications, you can get a lot of density by putting like NVIDIA has the Tesla architecture, which has four GPUs in a single one RU chassis. And the most CPUs you can get in a single chassis is, is two quad cores. So by hooking those together, you can get a lot more density than you can get in uh, out of a lot of CPU boxes put together. But, but that is not a technology thing, right? Uh, I may be wrong here, but I think that uh, the NVIDIA GPUs uh, burn a lot of power, right? It depends on the GPU. Four times the power that uh, an Intel quad core uh, burns, right? So I would say the opposite is true that uh, you, know, you can pack probably more Intel uh, quad core processors on a, on a single uh, motherboard than uh, GPU. That's something that we've done a, a lot of testing on. And we've there's not really metrics to measure this. So we've kind of created our own. And essentially what we've done is taken, oh, the question was, um, so GPUs use a lot more power, or are thought to use a lot more power than CPUs. And so 
does the density argument not necessarily work because you can't get as dense with GPUs as you can with CPUs? And it's, it's a really good question. And, and to, you're definitely right that right now, especially GPUs and parallel architectures, because they're not made by Intel, are a couple generations behind leading edge CPU processes. I think NVIDIA's top line cards right now are 55 nanometer, and all the Nehalem chips from Intel are on 32 nanometer. And so first of all, I think that's going to be changing, because Intel is certainly getting into the GPU game in a big way. And, and the reason I, I think that it's different this time than it's been when Intel's done GPU designs in the past is that they have committed to doing it on their leading edge process. They're, they're actually allocating fab capacity for the GPU for the first time. So I think the power differential will get get closer in time. I, I don't think there's a fundamental reason why GPU architectures are going to consume more power per you know, performance gigaflop than a CPU. Um, but going back to the measurements we've done, what we've done to try to evaluate this is we built basically a synthetic benchmark where we, we track frames per second per watt. And so we pick a, a standard transcode, say a, a 1080p decode scale encode, and we've We've measured how many frames per second we can get through a system at a given power performance. And what we found is that we are basically neck and neck with a CPU only implementation for if you look at a power efficiency. If you look at a cost efficiency, though, we're ahead by a significant 3 to 5 to 1 ratio. How about performance? Would you mind repeating the question? I just got a text message from somebody that uh, they can't hear the question. Oh, I'm sorry. OK. Um, save the questions for the end, I think that would just make it a little easier for people that are watching. OK, OK. Um, well, let me, let me finish this thread. So on performance front, the frames per second is basically performance. And so the more frames per second you can get per dollar or per watt, the better. And on the per watt number, right now we're seeing about dead even with CPU only implementations. On, the, on like the, the cost front, we're seeing a 3 to 5 X advantage over CPU only. So really good questions and, and it's stuff that's very difficult to, to really nail down. And we've been working on it, but there's a long way to go between before getting those metrics to be really reproducible and easy to explain and understand. Okay, so some of the, the focus points for us, you know, eliminating the need for specialized hardware. We certainly want to put folks that are using a ASIC, DSP, FPGA based solution. We need, to be, we need to be much better than them and, and reduce cost, because that's, that's where a lot of cost comes from. Outperform CPU-only competitors. Obviously, the, the CPU has the same economies of scale that the GPU has, so we really need to outperform those, or you just use the CPU-only solution. Now, one of the big questions is, you know, you can always get additional speed if you're willing to take hits on video quality, so there's things you can turn off to, to get more performance from a frames per second, frames per second metric. Well, with the GPU, we've been able to get the same quality video or, or very, very close without losing the performance that, that CPUs have to make. And then finally, core technology has been built with a really flexible API. And you know, this was something that we actually got really lucky on because when we founded Elemental, the goal was to sell SDKs to OEMs who would then integrate the product into theirs. And we went to build a big sales and marketing team and, and figure out how to deal with consumers and, and that sort of thing that we had no experience with. And it ended up that that's not the path we went down for productizing the, the technology. But because we built it that way, we've been able to get into different markets very quickly because the core technology is, is, has a really easy to use API. OK, so fo following on the, the need for speed kind of uh, mantra of this series, one really important thing that we had to get across to investors was why why does it make sense now to be working on a company like Elemental? Obviously, GPUs have been around since the graphical interface has been around, and people haven't been using them for video processing. Although they have been trying, we certainly found some research papers when we started this out of different universities where they would take one part of the codec and figure out how to parallelize it by trying to work through OpenGL or, or something else. But it, it was always like a really difficult, you could tell that they'd spent a lot of time trying to shoehorn a, a specific part of the codec into a programming language that was completely designed to do something else, and it was really painful. So this is what we did to, to convince folks that, look, this, there's a reason why it's different this time than in the past. So first of all, GPs have become immensely powerful. And 
This is a, a chart crib from NVIDIA, but you can see that as NVIDIA's added a lot more cores to their GPU, their raw gigaflop performance has gone up dramatically relative to the CPU. Now, if you put this on a logarithmic chart, it's, it's not nearly as impressive, um, but there still is a significant advantage, although Intel has made a, a great run recently, and especially with Nehalem, it's a, they've made a big comeback, I think, and it's going to be interesting to see over the next few years if this performance gap continues, or as everything becomes more multi-core, where is the line going to be between GPUs and CPUs? The only thing that I think we can say for sure is that you're going to need to be able to program in parallel effectively to take advantage of whatever architecture is out there. Second big key was, you know, with CUDA, GPUs have become extremely programmable, and that, that saved us. We weren't or, or some of the other really low-level assembly-esque languages. We needed something that we could write in standard C, that we could hire people that know C and, and should be able to figure out how to parallelize the codec effectively. Um, and, and CUDA certainly allows that. And it, it's getting really interesting now with the advent of Apple's OpenCL push and Microsoft has their own DirectX 11 compute shader, but all of a sudden it's gone from there being no way to program GPUs to being too many ways to programming GPUs. And it's, it's a challenge for a company like us because we have to make very cautious steps when we develop, when we invest in different development resources. And we can't just say, okay, we'll support all the platforms out there. We have to try to figure out which one is probably going to get enough, the most traction and, and, and win. And then third, the, the PCI Express bus allows very fast CPU, GPU communication. So, you know, up until PCI Express with, with ISA and, and BG, or and, um, I just lost the middle of us. I, ISA, AGP, thank you, <laughs> and PCI, you had a very fast bus from the host CPU to the device with the expectation that the graphics would be rendered and then displayed and there'd be no need for the GPU to deliver data back to the system. But with PCI Express, you now have a very fast symmetrical bus and any processing you do on the GPU can be delivered back to the system at the same rate. So that was really a key, a key invention, I think, primarily by Intel that, that made this, this possible right now. So this was, you know, this Elemental kind of was looking for the, the way to solve the video problem at a very good time because these trends were all coming together to make it make sense for the first time in, in, in GPU history. Okay, so this is a, a high-level look at our architecture. And again, the key is really that we harness the, the strengths of both processors. Um, choose up to 10x performances CPU only when you have multi-GPU systems. And again, efficient use of system resources is key. So the story is not just around harnessing the GPU, but it's also taking advantage of both these powerful processors that you've got in your average PC. And here, this is showing a, a high-level data path of, of how we do a, a transcode. And, you know, I, I didn't bring our latest diagram, but a lot of these, so the green boxes are the portions that we're doing on the GPU, while the, the blue boxes are the ones that we're doing on the CPU. And this was accurate about a year ago. We've now started to do a lot of things to, to have the GPU be able to pre-process the, the, the macro blocks before delivering back to the CPU for encoding because on, on high bit rate streams, the, the serial bit stream encoding can be the, the bottleneck. So you know, all of a sudden, no matter how fast your GPU is, if your CPU can't encode the, the serial portion fast enough, then it becomes a bottleneck and you can't get any more speed advantages. So, the, so say you take an MPEG-2 stream off a, a DVD and you initially we do the syntax decode and variable length coding decode on the CPU and then deliver the, the raw macro blocks to the GPU which performs MPEG-2 inverse quantization, inverse DCT, motion compensation. And then we actually, and I'll show you this in Bada Boom, one of the cool things about doing the, the decode on the, the GPU and keeping everything there is that we can in real time show the user the display frame buffer of that decode in a way that you could never do on the CPU. So on the CPU, if anyone here has ever done a, a conversion or transcode, you know, you get a progress bar that kind of shows you where you're at, but you can't show real time what's going on because copying a, a frame buffer from the CPU to the GPU into a DirectX frame buffer would take forever and, and really slow down your conversion. But we can do that because it's on, it's on the same, same chip. Um, so beyond just the core decode encoding technology, LML has also been working on a lot of kind of basic image processing, scaling, deinterlacing, um, color space conversion, color up sampling, down sampling, that sort of thing. And that all takes place in the, in the pixel domain. 
and then back to the, our, our 264 encoder. And of course, the motion estimation engine is really the, the burly part of what happens on the GPU. And that can consume, depending on how wide your search is, up to 70% of encode cycles. So we, we do that all on the GPU. DCT quantization, I don't have it on here, but the deblocking filter has also been completely implemented in, in the GPU. And then after that portion is complete, we deliver back to the CPU for the final entropy coding steps. But this is the, the core, the core um, technology that we've developed. And then the rest kind of sits on top of this and takes advantage of this to work inside standard applications. OK, this is probably pretty basic. But building it with a modular design is absolutely critical. You don't want to like, you know, the core technology that you're building for your company, you don't want to have that in any way restrictive to what end user applications could eventually use it. And so, you know, it's not only technically elegant, but absolutely critically allows great flexibility, extensibility, and scalability. So in our case, the, these green bars are, are, are platform layers. And, and we've built everything with the intention of being able to support multiple operating systems. And CUDA makes that very easy. CUDA's a, got a really nice cross-platform support. It runs on Mac OS, Linux, and Windows. Um, our initial work was all done in Windows, but we, we now have a Linux version. And, Performance is almost identical to the Windows version, so NVIDIA's done a great job there. Um, but then we have a GPU kernel abstraction layer as well, so theoretically we could switch between different GPUs without having to modify the video processing, excuse me, the video processing layer dramatically. And of course the application interface layer that lets any application talk to RapidHD as, um, as a, basically a, a client and, and call it to, to do whatever processing it needs. So what products are using this today? We, we do have an SDK that we have distributed to a couple kind of key strategic partners that are, are in market spaces that are um, not exactly where our core like end user products are, but that are somewhat adjacent. And I'll talk about those a little bit next. But um, that's been available for, for a little while. And the, there's the first few customers going to production with RapidHD SDK right now. Then our first end user product was something we call Bada Boom, the Bada Boom Media Converter. NVIDIA named it. Um, well, NVIDIA gave us some good suggestions when we picked one of them. So kudos to, to, to them. But it's really aimed at um, getting video onto mobile devices. And, and Elemental, I think, you know, since we didn't have a lot of marketing sales blood in our, our core founding DNA, we, we thought it would, might be a better way of, of getting our name out there by kind of producing a, a little end user tool that anyone can get and download and play with and get a sense of how well the software works. And Bada Boom has worked really marvelously well for that. There's, I think, a lot of people that have heard of Elemental only because of our little, our little trial where piece of code called Bada Boom. And then RapidHD Accelerator for Adobe Premiere Pro CS4. This is a Premiere Pro plugin. And we have a, a great relationship with NVIDIA. And they distribute our plugin with their Quadro CX board, which is a board they've basically targeted explicitly at Adobe Creative Suite professionals. So they've done a, a nice job of segmenting the market and, and saying, this board is for you if you're the kind of person that uses Photoshop or After Effects or, or Premiere. So the SDK, um, we, we actually had to overhaul a little bit for some of our, our, our more recent work, but it, it's been designed in such a way that there, there's good support for multi-GPU, so you can take advantage of as many processors as you can fit in your system. And then it's also been built in such a way where you can instantiate multiple decode, pixel processing, or encode stages. So if you want to take, say, a single decode stream and, and just encode that, but you also want to scale it and encode it in a separate resolution, you can instantiate a single decoder, a scaler, and two encoders. And that allows you to take more advantage of GPUs, especially as they have more and more stream processors. You might not be able to fully utilize a single GPU with a single stream, but as you add more and more streams, and, and most of the use cases today, especially in the professional and enterprise spaces, need a bunch of different outputs, a bunch of different encoded streams. And so that the, the SDK has really been designed in such a way to allow that. And it's very useful for our Premiere plugin and, and Bada Boom as well. So some of the, when I say the flexibility is just so important to a startup, you know, we, we never thought that virtualization was a market that might be a good fit for the technology. You know, it just didn't cross our frame of reference. 
And one of the most interested target segments has been virtualization customers who are who have no problem sending high frequency standard computer graphics and compressing that effectively to send over networks. They, they can't do that effectively with video. So uh, example company, um, uh, not, not a customer, just I, I know their business model, N Computing. N Computing has built a, a little tiny box that basically a single, like very standard PC can deliver video, can deliver data to up to 20 of these boxes. In these boxes, they build a little ASIC you know, they can support 20 clients with a single standard PC. Now that works great when you're doing word processing or Excel or, or internet browsing, but the second one customer, one of those users wants to watch a YouTube video, the system breaks down because then the, the CPU has to transcode the YouTube download to something that they can view on that client device and CPUs can only do one, maybe two streams, even at low resolutions. So, well, if you buy this server and it has a, a GPU that can handle all the video offload, all of a sudden that's a really strong use case for offloading processing of a virtual application. So because we built the API in such a way that it was really easy to drop into different applications, all of a sudden we could go after this market pretty aggressively. And, and that's been a really good, good success story for Elemental. Um, United States Intelligence Community, another one that I never thought would be a customer, but it turns out they have enormous amounts of video to process, and, and they, they, they searched us out when they heard about us, and since we had an SDK that had a pretty straightforward API, it was really easy to, to work with them. And then, of course, professional video editing. Does this have a hard stop? I realize it's almost, I don't want to. About uh, 15 more minutes. Okay, okay. I won't take that long. I'll just take a Should we have some time for questions? Yeah. OK. Um, OK, so bada boom. Easiest way to format video for any device. And I'll actually not just talk you through it. These are the key messaging points. But I can, and anyone who has an NVIDIA GPU, please download bada boom and, and give it a shot. Um, I can pull up here. Oh, you know, I think I need to. I don't think I've paid for the one on this, so here's the free trial. <laughs> I do own it. Um, so, you know, certainly we didn't consider ourselves user interface designers at all, and, and when we kind of decided to go down this route of actually building end user applications, we've had to learn a lot about, you know, what makes a good UI, and people argue whether this is good or not, but I think it's better than a lot of what's out there today. So you can pick a just a standard. This is a two and a half minute DVD clip. We allow you to do a preview and, and take a look at it. We also show you what the video is going to look like on the on the end user device, which I think is really cool because while we don't have a ton of control over, uh, we don't give you a ton of control over aspect ratio right now. I think that's something that most consumers just don't have a clue, and you may not want to have those huge black bars on your BlackBerry Bold, and and we have. We have the ability to, to play with the aspect ratio and let you see what it's actually going to look like on the device when you're done, which I think is a pretty big breakthrough in UI design for this type of application. So once you've decided what, which type of device you want to encode to, you just select the, the input, the output, and hit go. I have 21 runs remaining. And then this is, in real time, how fast the, the transcoding is actually occurring. So this is a two and a half minute clip. It, about nine times faster than real time. So we're doing the MPEG-2 decode, we're doing the, the downscale to the resolution of the, the iPod touch, and we're doing the H.264 encode. So 20 seconds for something that, you know, that's a, that's a two and a half minute clip. Movies that are longer take significantly longer, obviously, and they take significantly longer on, on CPU-only solutions. So if you did that in, say, Apple's iTunes, which is probably the way most people format video for their, their iPod, that would take, I don't know, roughly two and a half minutes. It can do it basically at real time for standard definition video. So it, for consumers, it's a really big speed up, and it really kind of illustrates what you can do on the GPU. That was a SD clip. We can do a, an HD clip as well. This is just a straight off uh, an ATSC receiver. Um, so to, to a BlackBerry, say, 20 runs. 
So you lose a lot of speed because you're having to deal with a lot more data, 720p versus, versus um, 480i. But it's still over 2x faster in real time. And when you do stuff like this on uh, CPU-only implementations, it takes a really long time to, to do that transcode. So it's a big performance boost. And the, the GPU I've got in this system is, a, is a actually a Quadro CX board. So it's the 192 stream processor, roughly equivalent to a GTX 260, if, if, you, if folks know the consumer cards that NVIDIA has. And again, anyone can download it, spread the word. $30 if you want to keep it and, and convert your whole library over to something for your mobile device. And then the, the big revenue producer for LML so far has been this board, the, the Quadro CX board, where our software is essentially OEM through NVIDIA. The only way you can get Rapid HD Accelerator for Premiere Pro is through this Quadro CX board. So it's, it's really kind of a, it's, it's got a lot of other benefits over standard NVIDIA cards beyond just the, um, our acceleration on there. But our acceleration really is the big selling point. And this is a board that sells for about $1,500 versus you know, roughly two, $250 for consumer class cards, a lot because of the elemental software that, that makes Premiere run faster. Um, and yeah, that was launched. We, this was something where, you know, partnering with a big company like NVIDIA and, and also Adobe, we worked very closely with Adobe on the technical side, was just absolutely critical because, you know, basically we were in lockstep with their launch of CS4, which is the new release of their, of their um, creative suite. And so all the marketing collateral and, and press outreach that they did around that launch kind of reflected on us as well since we released this card with NVIDIA at the same time. And you know, beyond that, Adobe schedules all these road shows where they go to different cities throughout the world and, and tell people about Creative Suite and, and Elemental has been able to be a part of that and show all these Adobe users, hey, you, can, you have to use a video card. You can't have to buy a GPU anyway. Might as well buy the GPU that is targeted for Creative Suite 4. And for a small company like Elemental, that's kind of a, a really huge marketing advantage that we simply would not have if we didn't have those relationships. And I can demo that afterwards. I want to give some time for questions. Um, but the quick conclusion is that Portland is a really cool place to live. And we're absolutely looking for, for talented GPU programmers and actually talented CPU programmers as well. So. If you're looking for a summer internship or full-time employment, Elemental would love to, to talk to you. And it's, it's a really fun place to work. You'd be working on mission-critical technology from day one that you're there, which you know, I think I, I've worked in big companies. I've worked at Intel and, and SGI and other big companies. And I've also worked at small companies like Pixelworks and Elemental. And different people have different risk profiles and determines which of those experiences you enjoy more. But I definitely recommend trying both before you kind of settle into your career wherever it is. So right. thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. Before we start them though, let me just switch over here back to this. So if you're watching remotely and you want to ask Sam a question, uh, we sort of have a low-tech solution here. Just send an email to that email address, uh, and we'll try to get your, to your question. And if so you're shy in here, you can also just use your laptop. You can use your laptop <laughs> if you're here, too. <laughs> yes? Inspiring uh, story, Sam. Mm, okay. uh, I've got lots of questions, but I want to ask you, uh, I'm trying to understand here, you, you're shipping a hardware product, right? NVIDIA is shipping a hardware product that includes our software. And would you mind repeating the oh, question? Oh, sorry. In yep. case, I think we're okay. Okay, the well, question was, um, are you shipping a hardware product? Right, I stepped in when you were showing that. Uh, uh, oh, the server edition, right, so correct. Okay. That, that's a forthcoming product that today we're not shipping, and today our product is all software only. So you're OEMing, uh, basically, NVIDIA is OEMing your solution. NVIDIA is the same style for you. For the Premiere product. For the um, Badaboon product, we're the end seller. And NVIDIA has been an important partner there, and they s we actually sell it through their, their end zone website but we have distribution rights on that. They're the exclusive distributor on Premiere product for a certain amount of time. So uh, your company does not uh, get into the hardware business, you're purely software. Today, that's correct. That, that's correct today, yeah. 
the enterprise market that we're that we're looking very hard at, it's it's quite likely we will ship so ship hardware because it's it's pretty technically challenging from a, a heat dissipation and power and, and everything to, to add GPUs to server chassis. So for that market, there's a very strong chance that we'll actually be OEMing a, a hardware product or, or partnering very closely with a, a, a person to, to fulfill the, to source the hardware. But it, we, we, Elemental will send a, sell an end user hardware product. And, and one final question. Mm -hmm. So you keep talking about uh, the advantages of GPUs versus CPUs, right? And, uh, how they can give you a boost in performance or uh, throughput, right? So can you give us an idea of uh, how a solution like this uh, can stack up to a multi-core, the quad-core uh, Intel-based dual processor, uh, one U uh, uh, pizza box versus an equivalent with four NVIDIA uh, GPUs um, doing real-time uh, video encoding for uh, let's say one megabit per second pipe, which is typical, the same pipe for DSL. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, well, first of all, in the, in the, so the question was, how does a, a CPU-based, say a fast, and I think the fastest ones are basically dual quad-core, one RU, so one pizza box has two quad-cores, versus an elemental uh, GPU-based solution where you can get up to four GPUs, but the, the minimum form factor is a two RU because, like, for example, in the Tesla architecture, you have one RU that's just devoted to the GPUs and you'd have a dual quad core basically driving that box. Um, it's roughly five to eight X performance improvement is what we're, we're seeing right now. And, you know, whether we use a Tesla type architecture or NVIDIA also has these new um, dual GPU cards and so you can fit two dual GPU cards in some of the newer server chassis. And, and one of the things that's really nice for us is that you couldn't buy server chassis a couple years ago that had PCI Express slots. And now they're building specialized chassis that just add that support explicitly. And so now there's actually some good options for us beyond just using a 1RU separated box just for the GPU compute. But yeah, 5 to 7x is kind of the performance advantage we get over that. Of Three to five x is is what we're what our initial metrics have shown. Yeah, and of course it you know it's it's changed a lot. I mean, the Nehalem has definitely narrowed that gap from when we started, and so we're certainly betting on GPUs to to keep increasing, and not just Nvidia obviously, but other vendors as well. We've, okay, the question is, um, how has CUDA treated you on the CPU side of things? And I would say it's treated us as well as a, a fairly new architecture, a, a new programming um, model could. It certainly requires a um, above average programmer to, to take full advantage of it. What we found is that pretty much um, any engineer can get something running on CUDA that's functionally correct but then the, the optimization process to, to get it running at speed as, as, as efficiently as possible is, is a challenging task. And it's very difficult. I mean, I, NVIDIA's done a fantastic job with CUDA, but at the same time, they have some built-in, you know, they, they have to abstract the, the, the hardware to a certain degree so that they can change that hardware in, in next generations and have your code still run. And so that, that abstraction layer has been challenging because when you don't, you don't understand the, or you don't know the exact details of the underlying hardware, it can be really difficult to optimize and it means optimization can be trial and error sometimes more than you'd like as opposed to understand the root cause of, of how the architecture should work. So I'd say, you know, it's, it's been as good as I think a new model could be, but it's still hard. It's still hard. Yeah. The uh, question was, you've just been using complete graphics cards. 
is attempting to go back and design a, a chip that would do exactly what we'd like. Um, Oh, I see. Okay, so basically create a card and put the peripherals around it. The, I guess the, the answer is no, primarily because if you don't have the, the CPU, in, and you're going to have to add a CPU, and with a GPU, you always have to have a CPU in the system. That makes the cost probably unmanageable. Not to mention, you know, GPUs require a lot of driver infrastructure. It's not, it's not like a real lightweight platform. So that's certainly been challenging for certain environments where like, weight is at a premium. For example, you know, one, one place that's encoding a lot of video these days is in unmanned aerial vehicles. And there's a, a very, very small weight limit that you can have on the, the electronics that takes the sensor, encodes it for delivery back to, back to wherever you are. So in those situations, it's, it's GPU is really a tough solution. Mm -hmm. Say, you know, what you're thinking about in terms of unification opportunities, complexity, etc. In that regard, for the future. The question is is around Larrabee and and I guess what Elemental's thoughts are on Larrabee. And um, this is a sensitive question for us, obviously, as we have important partners um, on, on both sides of that equation. I think it's I think it's you know it's very exciting that there's this kind of disruptive look at GPU architectures coming. And I think Intel has certainly taken on a big challenge trying to bring you know, a non-stream processor-based approach to the GPU space. And they're going to run into, I think, you know, the, the ecosystem is not designed to take a non-stream processor-based <coughs> product and effectively utilize it. Like, you know, I think if Intel can solve the DirectX you know, problem. If, they, if DirectX can run effectively on Larrabee, that would be an engineering feat by, by Intel. And I, I don't know how they're going to solve that. That said, I think applications that are written in Larrabee native will benefit from a very powerful core engine with a really nice threading model. And for applications like video processing, Larrabee is going to be very interesting, is, is our take at this point. So, good question. Sam, um, going back to the roots of the series, okay, we're interested in your thoughts on what's happening in the in the video processing space mm -hmm. that's going to continue to demand more and more performance. Mm. <coughs> Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question, and I actually kind of talked about that with your group a little bit. Um, so video is it certainly. It's all around us more than it ever has been. But it's not just around us more. There's, you know, it, 20 years ago, there was NTSC and PAL, and, and that was basically it. You know, there was two ways of, of transmitting video, and that, that was it. That was all you had to do. With the, the rise of the internet and mobile phones, there's now essentially, I don't want to say unlimited, there's, there's a lot of codecs, there's a lot of resolutions, there's a lot of bit rates, there's, there's just there's an enormous amount of formatting that has to happen for video distribution. I'm talking with folks from CBS and NBC. They've, they've told us that like, in their newsrooms now, for every little piece of content they produce, they have to create 250 to 500 digital copies in different formats of each little clip for distribution. Because the way it's shown on an airplane versus the way it's distributed to video on demand versus over cable versus over satellite versus over internet. It's just it's an enormous number of, of formats that now to, to track users and where they're capturing video or where they're, where they're viewing video, you have to transcode an enormous number of times. Um, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but YouTube is getting on the order of a, I think it's a half million videos a day that are being uploaded. And, and so Google servers are spending a lot of time transcoding each one of those videos to all the different types of, of distribution outlets. So from that perspective, the, the demand is growing very fast. What's really interesting for a company like Elemental is that the goal of all this, the, you know, right now there's a lot of video distribution on the internet, but there's not been very effective monetization strategies around it. So people are making almost no money, but having to spend a lot of money to, like creating these different types of streams and paying content delivery networks to deliver that video, but they're not getting paid the same as they get paid by major ad networks for, for broadcast. 
So there's a lot of really innovative ways that people are trying to figure out how to create video that is targeted at specific users. So there's some rough ways of doing it right now, but you know, fundamentally, ad insertion is, is growing very fast. And, and not just like inserting it, splicing it between video segments, but, but adding, it to the, adding it to the video frames themselves. So say you have a, a product placement that you want to, say in Oregon right now, you want to get the umbrella because it's raining. And, and here it's cold, so you want a, a Starbucks hot chocolate. If you could real-time transcode and deliver the video for each user, which is kind of the, the holy grail, and you could do product placement that's very user-specific just the way you can with Google today and, and Google text search. And obviously, Google targets the text based on exactly who has done that search, based on your search history, based on a lot of other things, probably from a privacy perspective that we should be concerned about. But that, that same goal is, is there with video. And the only way to make that really happen is to do real-time encoding of each of those streams that's being delivered to each user. And until the computation cost comes way, way, way down, that's, that's cost prohibitive. But if companies like Elemental can help drive that, that cost way down, then, then, and you have the opportunity to, to real-time transcode and encode every single stream that's delivered on every single type of device, then the need for speed becomes very critical. Yeah. It looks like we have a question from somebody online. Andy. Vinay, are you applying for an internship at, Pixel, or at Elemental right now? <laughs> I'm sorry, can you read it one more time? Um, performance is always compared on GPU and CUDA versus CPU, where resources vary. Is this a fair comparison? Well, it, it, OK, so do I need to repeat that one? Or are you? Could you repeat it? OK, the question is, so your, your, your GPU performance is, is CUDA and NVIDIA versus CPU. And is that a fair comparison because the, the different processors vary? Um, well, it, it's a really difficult comparison to make because there's huge variation in the performance of different GPUs and different CPUs. So you know, all you can really do is say, OK, my system has a, a, a Xeon 3 gigahertz you know, CPU, and I'm testing it against a GTX 280 from NVIDIA with that same, that same Xeon and, and go from there. So, you make it as fair as you can. There's, there's always ways to skew benchmarks and, and make yourself look better or, or worse than the competition. Um, you know, I, I think the fact that Elemental has been able to achieve, you know, pretty fundamentally a, a three to five x with a, a, a brand new codec that we wrote from scratch, we're probably just tapping into the efficiencies and the performance of the GPU. You know, CPU-based and, and DSP-based codecs have been worked on for years and years and years, and it takes a long time to really optimize any type of, of codec implementation. And so I think we're just scratching the surface on, on GPUs, and, and over time, they'll get, they'll get better and better. And so yeah, it's, it's as, fair as, as fair as the eye of the observer, I guess. Any more questions? I just have a really quick follow-up question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, the problem of CUDA was the abstraction layer, and that you had to, uh, and it, it seemed like it was CUDA, CUDA made it easier to, to program, uh, to write a bad program for the GPU, but to write really good, high-performance code for the GPU, you have to kind of defeat that abstraction layer a little bit. You have to, uh, and, and so the question is, once you've got That's okay. Really, really good question. And the question was, since CUDA makes it much easier for um, the average programmer to get initial implementation up and running, but then to to really optimize it, there's a lot of trial and error might be a little extreme, but there's a lot of experimentation that has to happen. Um, what happens when NVIDIA releases the next GPU, which of course has that same abstraction layer, but the underlying hardware has changed a little bit, and how does that impact your performance? NVIDIA has been, has been pretty committed to, to minimizing the impact. Our experience has been that we've only seen one of those architecture transitions so far, which was from the, the G80 slash G90 platform to the GT200. And 
our performance went down a little bit, and we've, we've had to do a few optimizations, but it's been pretty minimal, less than we would have anticipated. But I think also the, the transition from G8090 to GT200 was not a huge transition, and so if it was a larger one, I, I'd be, I, I think we're, we're very curious to see what that's like. And, and the, the hope is that, you know, OpenCL and, and DirectX 11 Compute Shader kind of become important enough that the GPU vendors have to be very careful about how they do that to make it so they don't break all the existing GP GPU code. I mean, it makes you realize how incredibly difficult Intel's challenge is to make CPUs get faster and faster without breaking underlying code. And, and the GPU vendors haven't had to deal with that yet. They've been really insulated from it. But you know, if CUDA and, and parallel programming are going to thrive and proliferate, they have to be as disciplined and as, you know, as same from generation to generation from a programmer perspective as the CPU is. Sam, thank you very much for a very enlightening talk, and we wish you all the success. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.